ever. I am Tabisile Sitaba. I'm a co-founder of an app called Send Off. So what we do is to provide a holistic death care approach. So what is a death care approach? We help you plan adequately for the time that you will not be here. We help you plan your finances, your estate planning, as well as your funeral logistics. So I have asked uh, two of my colleagues to come in here so that we really have conversations around death and death care. I understand that for some people, the conversation of death is not really comfortable. But I think we've seen what happens when we don't adequately plan. We all know that house that is still being fought for from 10 years ago. We all know those kids that were deprived of their inheritance. We know um, of many people that did not have enough money for funerals. So this is where we understand that you have needs that needs to be fulfilled at the time of your passing. And really, this is just an interactive session. We just want to empower you with knowledge because we do realize that a lot of us buy with fear. That is why we are overcovered and have five uh, funeral covers and have so many life policies. But uh, okay, being an independent financial planner is able to assist us navigate through the financial services. And Yolanda will be able to assist us in navigating through adequate estate planning. So Kay, I'm on your platform, but I'm going to say welcome. And I'm assuming a lot of people that are here know what you're doing. But for those of uh, us or some of the people that are here for the very first time today, maybe you can just do an introduction and tell us more about the financial services that you offer around death care. Okay, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. My name is Kay Mbovu, and I am an independent financial advisor, personal finance coach, and personal finance coach, and I am registered with the FSCA. So one of the things that I do supply with in terms of death care, it's your um, wealth protection. We call it wealth protection. So what does that mean? It means that um, if you have debt, if you need to make sure that your loved ones um, after you pass on, they have sufficient enough money for them to continue with their life. Because the unfortunate thing about death is that you die with your ability to make income, but you don't die with your expenses. So your kids will still need to go to school. Your kids will still need a shelter to stay in. So I help you towards that through giving you things like your life covers and explaining what they do for you and your loved ones in the event of your death. And again, what they do to your debt because you don't want to leave your debt with your loved ones. I absolutely love that. My catchphrase is you do not die with your expenses. I think oh. that we need to really understand that very well. Yes. Um, and Yolanda, can you kindly introduce yourself and let everybody know what you're doing and what are some of the services that you provide around death care? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Yolanda Mnyengeza. Uh, I'm very sorry I have a bit of flu, so yeah, my nose may be a bit uh, running from time to time, so I'll switch off my camera. Uh, so <clears throat> what I do is I'm an attorney and uh, I run a, a law firm here in Johannesburg. So our law firm specifically focuses on uh, planning for people's death or just, uh, yeah, uh, let's say, uh, putting your affairs in order. Uh, so we look into things like your wills, we look into things like your estate planning from a legal perspective. CK is talking about having sufficient money when you pass away to cover for everything that you're going to need. With us, we take it further. We don't go there, but rather what Kay has put in place, we try to structure it for you because as much as you may have that in place, it might not take your family too far if you don't have a proper plan in place. So that's where we come in. We make sure that the money that you're leaving behind is going to stretch so that it covers and protects your family's financial interests for, for the longest time. So we look also into things like your trusts. Is it something that you can do now? If so, what should we do? So we try to capacitate you as much as possible uh, so that you also understand these things because we have to be honest here. Uh, these majority of what we're talking about here, these financial and estate planning tools are not really things that we understand uh, are not things that we have had the opportunity to tap into so now we're trying to bring them out to people so that they understand them and also tap into them so that they leave their families in better positions so that's practically what we do amongst other services but this is our main focus so yep 
Thank you very much, Yolanda. Kay, I know this is quite a common phrase and I'd really like you to tell us how do you overcome this conversation or the subject when you are engaging with the different clients. When you talk about death, um, a lot of people would tell you that I have no intention to die anytime soon, so why must I start planning now? And to that, what are some of the most common mistakes that you see people make around their finances in planning for their end of life or death care? Okay, yeah, that is a common one, and I don't want to come here and act like I've never said that before when I was still young. I remember when I started working, um, a financial advisor approached me, I think I was 21 when I started my first job, and then they were like, we need to give you a life cover and explaining everything. I was like, guys, I'm 21, I'm not going to die. You know, I think that is one of the things that we believe, you know, when it comes to death, especially in our black community. So we believe the older people are, um, you know, the likelihood they're going to die. But I think after COVID, you know, things have been at least a little bit better, I would love to believe, because we had a place where in a family member, in a family, four family members were dying. As much as it was said, but I think it did kind of like open up uh, something when it comes to the fact that anybody can die at any time. So the most things that a lot of people do um, or don't do when it comes to their finances is when they don't plan for their debt. I'll make an example with something like a home loan. A home loan, normally it's, um, it's 20 years. So what they do, they don't plan in the event that, okay, this 20 year loan that I'm taking, in the event that I pass on before the 20 years, what's going to happen? I mean, we're speaking about a shelter here. So what then happens if you don't plan accordingly in the event of your death? Now you have this home loan for two years and then you and, uh, suddenly you die. So what's going to happen? The bank, I always say this, they are a business. They will want their installment each and every month. So there you are. You think I've left a shelter for my family, but that shelter is not yours until you finish to pay it off with the bank. So what will happen? The bank will come knocking. Hi, are we looking for the payment? Because the property belongs to us. And then you find out that in your family member, in your family, none of your family members are working and getting the income that you used to get so they go like but we can't afford an installment of twenty thousand per month and they go like then what happens now the bank is like unfortunately we need to take the property because it belongs to us and they your family will then stay without a shelter so a lot of people don't plan the plan um they are they are well but they don't protect it they feel like, and I think most of the other things, they feel like things like insurances, it's a scam because they don't really understand that insurance protects them and protects the wealth that they're trying to build for their family. I love the last part you said about uh, a lot of people commenting that insurance is a scam, you know, and I think also that I'm not going to clear the insurers and say they're all clean and they all act in good faith. Uh, but one of the things that I've realized is that a lot of us go and buy insurance without doing a thorough research. You ask your friend who covers you and you go and take that insurance, not understanding what are your needs and what is that product going to help you achieve. Uh, thank you so much for that. Yolanda, what I normally say is that, you know, death care is quite interlinked. That is why we need a holistic approach because what Kay has just said also has an impact on how you wrap up the estate. Can you kindly also brief us of the common mistakes that people make when they do their estate planning? Well, the first mistake is not even having an estate planning session. Oh. That's, that's the biggest problem we have. Uh, people just take out things like your funeral policies and then that's it. Then they pass away. <clears throat> that's the biggest problem we have. So when you die without even having an estate planning session, it means that we're going to have a problem. First problem is when we have to speak to your family who you've left behind. First thing that they're going to fight about who's going to be the executor of this estate. There's already debacles as soon as you pass away. Secondly, anybody has an opportunity to literally just go around and try making claims because you did not put anything in place. Uh, so that's our biggest problem. And the second mistake that a lot of people tend to make uh, is not to understand the legal implications uh, of, of whatever it is that they are putting in place. For instance, like Kay is saying, she would advise people to take out life policies. But the biggest mistake people will do is they will name minor children as, as the beneficiaries of these life policies. 
Now these parents, they have no idea when they will die. Sometimes they die when these kids are still young, still under the age of 18. What happens then is that we don't have control. They don't have control. The family doesn't have control. And I think the worst thing that often happens in that situation is the money ends up being paid to the person that's taking care of, uh, taking care of this child that they've left behind. And, and we have to be honest with ourselves. Majority of the time, when these people get those millions, within a year, if, I mean, a, a year is quite long. If within six months, the money is gone because it was paid onto them. They have no financial literacy. They have never handled this amount of money. So they get overwhelmed and it's exciting to have these millions. But now the biggest setback is for that child because that money that you put aside was so that that child can get to a certain stage. But now that's, that's a loss because you didn't do a proper thorough estate planning session. I think the other uh, mistake that a lot of people tend to make um, is to just name anybody as an executor. Uh, people have estates that are still lingering for seven years because they just chose. And another big problem that comes with this is that people love free things. Eh? They love going where it's called free. I, I always say that you must just be careful when you go for free things. Somebody saying, I'll do it for free for you. There's always a catch. We're professionals here. I can't be sitting with 20 people doing things for free, for nothing. There's obviously something that I have in mind. So how is that going to impact you? Now, normally a lot of people find out after the death of these people that unfortunately the effect is that it's going to take seven years, 10 years. Others have given up because it's going nowhere. It's a dead end because they just went somewhere to just draft the will uh, for, for, for free. That's another thing people need to be careful of. And the last thing that I, I just want to mention that I think is a big mistake. Um, oh, my thought is gone now <clears throat> because I wanted this one. Uh, is, is, is not understanding the legal implications of the things that you require in your estate planning. Uh, people come to you and say, I want you to draft this like this. Just just say this in this will. And they don't want to listen at times. And unfortunately, if you don't want to listen, then I'd have to draft whatever it is that you say I must draft. One thing you must do every time you go for an estate planning session and you're going to also draft a will with that person. Also understand the terms that you want included in that will because some of the terms are quite cumbersome. And I always say this when it comes to people wanting to leave houses as family houses. Think about your family dynamics. Is this thing really going to work here? Do you think this is the, the only best option here? Why not ask the legal practitioner if there are other options to do this better? Because what we see with these family houses is that people are killing each other because of them. Uh, others are just not comfortable in these houses. They end up leaving them. It's a whole mess. So when you're doing an estate planning session, uh, make sure that you think about everything not only just what the money that you're leaving behind your family dynamics how you're conducting yourself right now and this one is specifically uh, uh, for the purposes of things such as your pension funds yeah? people must always think about how they conduct themselves because that also affects uh, everything that will happen after that irrespective of the type of estate planning uh, we could offer to you Thank you very much, Yolanda. You've touched on a very important uh, subject, which was trending for the longest of time on Twitter. And this was around, you know, um, some people giving some people money. And when it comes to their pension funds, now those people have a certain claim to your pension funds. And in most cases, this happens to be your girlfriends, not even your wife. So if you can just briefly elaborate on that. See, with a pension fund, uh, it's, it's one of those things that you really have minimal control over. Because, um, so even though you might have that nomination form, as we all know, as people with pension funds at work, they will say, sign a nomination form, give people percentages. That's fine. But the biggest problem with the pension funds is the fact that if you, when you are still alive, start now uh, paying, let's say, uh, your, your side check, 
You give them money. If they say they need to go to the doctor, you send them money. If they say they need this, you send them money. And if that person comes forward after your death and says that you were taking care of them, unfortunately, those percentages that you had put in place there in that nomination form will literally be shifted around. And sometimes, you know, even though you're married and you've nominated also your kids, sometimes the trustees will give that side chick more money than your kids. Uh, you'll see that sometimes the, the, the wife will get 50, the side chick will get 30. Those kids will, you know, have to share amongst the 20. And that's something we don't have control over. And which is why I always say to people, especially when we are having a discussion, be mindful of the things that you are doing. Be mindful of how you conduct yourself. This also speaks to the debts. A lot of people don't uh, take into account that some of the debts, like Kay was saying, are still going to be lingering over your family's head, right? So you always need to be mindful of how you conduct yourself because it will determine what happens uh, at the time of your death when we have to administer your estate. And I just want to add something. Sorry, um, I love what you said, um, especially when it comes to pension fund. Because a lot of people, when I sit with them, they go like, okay, I don't need a life cover. My pension fund is going to cover everything. And I always have to tell them that the unfortunate thing about a, a pension fund, it's not administered by you. The trustees decide on who will benefit more, depending on how you were then helping them while you were still alive. So I'm so glad that you mentioned that because a lot of people think that pension fund is just going to be... It's, it's just going to cover everything in the event of death and they don't know that the, it is administered differently depending on who you were financially helping when you were still alive. I'm so glad we're having this conversation because we really need to start empowering people and from the you know, from the conversation, what I'm getting is that a lot of how you conduct yourself while still alive has a huge impact when you've passed on and I'd really like to touch on that. I just want to say to all the people that are tuned in, I'm noting your questions. Uh, we will get to the questions most definitely. The ladies are here. We're here to give you answers where we can. Uh, Kay, back to you. So I understand when we started the conversation, you said that you're in varsity and you thought, I don't need this. Is there a certain age where you need to start thinking about these things? Yes. So when it comes to death, it's that um, as long as you are 18 years and then you are getting an income, you will be able to start doing your financial planning. Because what happens is that um, in 18 years, we see it's the, it's so sad to say it, but kids as young as 18, they are having kids. The question is, in the event that you die, who's going to take care of that child? So you start thinking differently, especially when you have somebody that you're taking care of um, when it comes to finances. I love the fact that um, she also mentioned about your, your wills because people feel like I don't have any assets, I don't have too many assets, but you have a child who's going to be a guardian of your child. So immediately when you start having somebody that you're responsible for, you need to start doing proper financial planning. So, and when it comes to insurances, the younger you are, the more it benefits you when it comes to in terms of premium. Because in the insurance world, what works is how high risk are you for that particular company? So if I had taken my life cover at the age of 20, I was going to be benefiting more in terms of paying less premium than if I take it at the age of 35, because age plays a huge factor. So if you know that you have debts, you have, um, especially you are a breadwinner, because um, in our African families, I can still be the last born of the family, but I can be the one that is the breadwinner, even if I have older siblings. So as long as you know that in your salary, there is somebody that you're taking care of, you need to have planning in place. Because life cover, it's not for enrichment. Let me just say that. Life cover, it's what replaces your income when you are normal. So when you pass on, you die with your work, you die with your income. Then the life cover will then kick in to continue paying the things that you were responsible for when you were still alive. Wow, absolutely informative because I think a lot of us focus on uh, just the funeral cover and I always say that funeral cover is just for one day, it's a one day event. After the funeral, there are still lives that need to be taken care of. So what are some of the products that uh, you would advise people to take in order to ensure their wealth and also 
benefit because I think when we start talking about death care, people think I'm not going to benefit for this thing from this thing, you know. Um, so I'm not going to be able to enjoy my money. It's all about leaving money for my family. Are there some, you know, some products not to to mention names <laughs> that will be able to assist um, people such as education plan or any other investment that you can make that can give you an ROI now and as well as for your family when you've passed on? Okay, yeah, that's a very good question because I know a lot of people like saying that life cover, but it's not for me. But uh, let me go back to the example that I've done when it comes to your home loan. So um, I always ask people, well, what is your greatest asset? And a lot of people don't realize that they are their greatest asset. Because if your hand breaks right now and you do a job that requires your hand, you cannot perform that job. And it means that you might, if you know, your, your company is not uh, giving you the benefits of, you know, uh, things like you can get your disability covers and things like that at work, you will then not be able to conduct that work and your income will then be less. So think in your life cover, a life cover is just like a parent. There are siblings, there's a family in it. So in it, um, she mentioned, sorry, um, sorry, I, for, I, I forgot her name, <laughs> sorry. Yolanda. <laughs> Yolanda, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to read here, and I know you gave me a different name, Yolanda. Yolanda mentioned something like, you know, your kids, you know, your trust fund, your kids must, you need to still make money for your kids. So things that I want to mention is that when you have a life cover, you can then add something that is going to protect your kids' education so that it's not paid out to the guardian who might misuse your like your your the money for your kids because let's be honest you can still have a discussion with your sibling right now to say i want you to be my guardian and they will still be a good person but you never know you never know what's going to happen when you pass on so there are other guardians unfortunately that will take the money and misuse it and your child does not go to school so one of the other beautiful benefits that a life you can put inside a life cover is that can my kids go to school and can this be paid to the school directly? That ensures that even if my guardian decides that she does not want to take my child to school, even if I've left this amount of money, then they can then pay directly to the school until their first undergrad. So even if you pass on while they're still in crash, they'll pay for their primary, they'll pay for their secondary, they will then pay for their undergrad education directly to the school. So it's all up to the child if she will then or he will then continue to go to school. So that will benefit the child even if maybe you know longer alive. The second thing is that in, in, in the example that I've made of home loan and you getting disabled and you can't be able to work, the unfortunate part, the bank is going to come and knock still. They don't care if you had all the want is the instalment. So you will be able to add something called a um, temporary disability or permanent disability cover. What does that mean? It means that in the event that you get disabled, it will then kick in to pay your home loan while you are still alive. And that home loan, that, that home will then belong to you and not belong to the bank anymore. So you can benefit from that uh, protection while you're still alive. And uh, when it comes to investment, other things that you can also do, again, you can also do your educational plan. Uh, but with the educational plan, it's a topic on its own because there are different investments where you can put the educational plan and um, help your, 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 the savings for your child for them to go to, to school. And one of the major things we saw with, with COVID, you know, um, this chronic illness, you never know when, and we see in our country, there's high numbers in the insurance, the highest claim is cancer. And cancer is a terminal disease. So if you in future get cancer because of the food that we're eating, we're so likely to get cancer. You can be able to get an amount of money that's going to pay while you are still alive. And then you can settle everything while you are still alive, including your home loan, your car loan, and also make sure that your kids can still get their living expenses. So a life cover is a parent, and then you can add all those other benefits, including again, things like your retirement investment as well, which you can then benefit by, uh, even if you did not retire, as long as you are 55 years and older, you can be able to withdraw from it and also make sure that by the time you retire, you retire comfortably. You know, that is, is such a fountain of knowledge because I was having a conversation with Yolanda the other day and to your point earlier on that expenses follow you through the grave. Mm -hmm. And this goes to my next question, Yolanda. Uh, you know, when people pass on, right, and they were living in credit, they end up leaving their dependence with credit instead of an inheritance. 
So for example, you might think that you have an you have assets that are worth five million rand and you have debts that are seven million rand. And you think that um those assets are intact, but in actual fact, you're leaving your kids in a bad financial state. Can you expand more on that? All right. Uh, so I think one of the biggest reasons why we end up having this kind of situation uh, is I think the misinformation that's out there that uh, when you pass away, uh, your debt is going to be cancelled, uh, but that's not how it works. And as a result of this type of misinformation, a lot of people uh, handle things very recklessly. And because of this, <clears throat> they end up leaving their families with a lot of debt. I mean, a lot of debt. And, and the second issue we have with this is the fact that people think that each time they take out a debt, automatically that debt is protected by that financial service provider. And uh, majority of the time, that's not the case. Like Kay was saying, in the case of a, a bond, for instance, you have got to place like something like a life policy to protect it. Uh, in the case of your credit as well, you've got to have something to protect that should something happen to you. But a lot of people have this thing that uh, automatically when I take out a debt, it's already covered, right? And another reason we end up with this situation where people die with a lot of debt is because people think that the assets or the debts that they have are assets. They, they have a, a difficulty understanding the distinction between the two. For instance, in the case of a bond, you might think that's an asset. It is not an asset at this current point. If you're still paying, that is a debt you're leaving behind. And you need to have a plan on how this debt is going to be settled when you pass away. Like Kay was saying, uh, the people that you're leaving behind are probably not going to be able to afford to pay uh, the monthly fee that you were paying to the bank. Those repayments, they're probably not going to qualify, especially if those people are under the age of 18. Now, people don't think about this, and as a result, they end up leaving their families in these kind of financial situations, where now we have a situation where if there is debt and also there are assets. And I think the most painful thing, uh, Tabi, is not the fact that people leave more debt than the assets that they have. Rather, is people leaving debt that cannot be settled, and now we have to sell a big asset to settle just, you know, the small debt. For instance, people leave credit card debt, like 70,000 Rand, 100,000 Rand, and then they leave a house probably worth 1 million. But now the problem is that there is no liquidity to pay that 70,000 Rand. So now we have to resort to selling this big asset just so that we can cover 70,000 Rand. Does that make sense? It really doesn't make sense because it tends to be a disadvantage to your family. For instance, in the case of selling a property, once people start seeing money, they will not think that after settling this 70,000 Rand, let's go buy another property. Already people are thinking about, I want my share. I will see what I do with my money. And there's nothing that you can do because they are entitled to that amount of money. And it's unfortunate that the people that tend to be at the receiving end here are kids, uh, people that are under the age of 18. They are the ones at the, at the receiving end because they lose that home that they had. And there isn't much that we can do about this thing because the law says that the people that are owed by you have to still be settled. I mean, this is a case that I spoke about, uh, I think, two, three days ago. This lady had the same problem, was married to a man who had taken out certain debt. This man didn't leave money. This woman didn't have money to settle these debts. A couple of years later, the court has said this house must be sold. She doesn't have another plan. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? She's, she's lost. Yolanda, you just went on mute. I don't know what happened. Okay. Oh, okay, you can continue. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. So, yeah, like I was saying, a roof over her head is lost. All because of what? A small nyana debt 
that she cannot settle because she doesn't have liquidity. This is also another problem we have. People don't leave actual money. They think that by having asset, they've got everything. We need money. SARS needs money. If you come to me uh, to administer your estate, you need to pay me. You know, there are certain taxes that need to be paid. So these are just some of the struggles we have when it comes to these issues. But debt, I think people just need to understand how debt works right now when they're still alive so that they can make better choices and also when they pass away so that they can put in place a proper plan so that they, their families don't have to lose their assets.